And as always, it's great to have uh, friends new and old uh, on the line. Hey, Alana, nice to see you. Alexander, Bert, good to have you uh, here joining us. Ellen, uh, our speaker for next week. Uh, great to have you, Yvonne. Great to have you in class. Uh, Jane, thanks for coming and visiting. Janina, always great to see you. Keith, lots of uh, new friends I've been making during the um, during this COVID lockdown. Nancy, always a pleasure. Thank you for joining us. Nancy's a, a dear friend from my days at the Miami Herald and has been doing just such an amazing job um, writing about COVID uh, and businesses and its impact. Nancy, are you able to go off mute for a second? I don't know if you're near your computer. Yep. Nancy, uh hi. Um, if you can turn on your screen, great. No worries if you can't. But um, before we get started, can you tell us about the work that you're doing with the SBA and with Refresh? Because honestly, you're one of the most important providers of information. Uh, you've been that for years, uh, even dating back to when you were at the Herald. So maybe you could just quickly just share what you've been up to before we get started. Oh, sure. Um, basically, I've been writing about uh, entrepreneurs and small business as much as I can um, as a freelancer. And I do have a blog on um, uh, growbiz at, at uh, fiu.edu for small businesses, about growing small businesses. I wrote about um, startups on refreshmiami.com and um, for other clients whenever I can. So yeah, that, yeah. And I, I love it. I love doing it. And of course, now we're writing a lot about, um, you know, how, how small businesses are surviving and thriving through this um, in, in any way that they can. So I'm always yeah. uh, look, look forward to hearing from people. Guys, um, on the chat, if you've ever read an article by Nancy Dahlberg, whether it was in the starting gate when she was at the Herald uh, or more recently on the SBDC and Refresh blogs, can you give her a quick thank you and shout out? Um, she has been so helpful to me in my own personal journey as, a, as an entrepreneur. And, you know, us journalists uh, uh, don't always get to hear from our audiences and the recognition that, honestly, we crave. Um, and so if you get a second, um, take a quick second and thank um, Nancy for, for, for all that she does for us as a community, you know, on behalf of all of us small business owners, Nancy, I cannot thank you enough for the resources, your work, your dedication, and for sticking with us despite you know turmoil in the journalism industry. It's been mm -hmm. um, just amazing to watch your reinvention and to see you continue doing your life's work. So thank and, you very much. And to you, and to you. Thank you very much. And I've really been enjoying these uh, these seminars each week. They've been really, really informative. I'm sure the Everybody else thinks so too. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm really excited and honored to be able to offer these and, you know, have folks of your caliber on these li the line is just, um, it's very humbling and really exciting for me. Um, thank you, Nancy, for that. If you could put your blog, your refresh, your SBDC, any other resources that you want us to keep in mind. We, some of us might not know uh, everywhere that you're publishing. And, oh, sure. And please let me know, um, you know, if there's anything more that BizHack can do in support of your important work, we're uh, in this with you. Oh, thank you very much. Look You're forward welcome. to today's session. Absolutely. Um, well, speaking of today's session, Bruce is back, and I'm excited to let you know that he's going to make it a public announcement for the first time uh, about a new offering that he has, um, and I could not be more excited about it. Uh, for those of you who are interested in learning more, we're going to go a little bit past 1.30 today so that he can talk a little bit more in depth and take your questions uh, about his big announcement. Um, I will say that, number one, I'm going to be participating in it. Uh, he gave me an early heads up. And number two, his seats are limited, and he's announcing it to his 45 million LinkedIn followers tomorrow. Uh, how many LinkedIn followers do you have? Only 240,000. <laughs> I knew it was a lot, a quarter million, cheese. So anyway, I think his seats are gonna get filled up tomorrow. So if this is something you're interested in, uh, I mean, Bruce is a guy who does keynote addresses in the six figure and the five figures 
um, and he's bringing uh, for the first time an offering that uh, us mortals can afford. So anyway, more on that. Stick through to the end and hang on a little bit past 1.30 if you want to hear more of that. We're going to give you, though, uh, a full hour of amazing free content. He's going to be talking about how to achieve certainty in an uncertain time. Um, and uh, next week, uh, we have a, another incredible session with my dear friend of many years, Ellen Marchman, who's also uh, on uh, today's webinar about how to consciously communicate uh, during re-entry. Uh, we are slowly starting to reopen and how you reopen is as important as how you st shut down. And, and it's really, really easy to screw this next part up because it's gonna be subtle. Uh, it's not gonna be like we're back to normal. There is no back to normal. And um, Ellen is gonna think really hard with us about how to communicate uh, your re-entry in a, in a sensitive and smart and safe way. I'm also going to be moderating a panel discussion again with SFIMA, South Florida Integrated Marketing Association. I'm a board member there. It's about SEO. It's a much more technical session. It's with Joe Larotro, Larotro uh, one of the top SEO experts in town. Please come to that. Links to all of these will be sent in a follow-up email uh, right after today's session. Lilia Posos, our amazing uh, community manager and behind-the-scenes person, will be sending that. And then in two weeks, we're gonna be doing a session on building community, the power and potential of it. Uh, I gotta say that uh, Shana is an extraordinary talent and mind and really knows how to create a tribe of people to support your business, which becomes, especially in times of crisis, the most powerful thing to carry you through. Um, I know I'm excited for that session and I'm gonna learn a lot from her about how I can grow out the BizHack community that I've been working on. You know, those of you who've been to these sessions, you probably heard my introduction before. So all I'm gonna say is the thing that's on my mind today uh, as a business owner is I pivoted hard uh, two months ago when we had to go from in-person to online classes. Yesterday, we launched our first five-week accelerated course. It's an online course. And I am thrilled to announce after a flurry of signups that we sold it out. It was an unbelievable feeling to see 44 people on our first session yesterday. A number of you are probably here with me today. So uh, I am so proud of my team uh, uh, to how quickly we moved and launched this. Um, and because of the kind of success that we're, keep, we're having, we're going to do another in June. And so if you are interested in learning more, in applying, uh, in being a part of this movement we're building to help business owners with their online lead generation. Here are some links uh, that you can use. Um, and I just want to say uh, again, thank you, Lilia, uh, and to all of you on the call for your referrals. Uh, Lilia, with, who works with me at BizHack, for sticking with me in these tough times. I, I so appreciate you and everything you've done to make these webinars and our paid offerings a big success. So thank you. Uh, on to today's featured event, Bruce is going to talk about why now is not the time to go it alone. What's the number one thing you need to do today for success tomorrow and why now is the best time to recreate yourself. Um, a lot of us are pivoting and finding new business models. Uh, certainly that's been the case for BizHack and going from a primarily purveyor of in-person training to now a fully online one and accelerating our course from 12 weeks to the new five. So um, we're doing our best to take your good advice, Bruce. Bruce is an extraordinary speaker and author. I was reading your book last night, all about them. Um, it's one of his big messages. He's the author of a number of books. And he is a, as I mentioned, five-figure keynote speaker who has had to reinvent himself in his business as a lot of the keynote speeches he has have been deferred until it's safer to do so. He's also a musician and a really badass harmonica player. Um, we had a graduation that he, he was a student of ours a few um, semesters ago and he did a harmonica tutorial uh, and I still have that harmonica sitting uh, in my office um, and uh, very memorable. Uh, it's a big part of his um, presentation is his musical uh, prowess and ability. And you might remember from the last time he spoke a couple weeks ago uh, that I showed you some of his sketches. I dug up some more. 
So when he took the class with us, little did I know, I thought he was avidly taking notes. What he actually was doing was sketching everybody in the class. Um, and there are some of his sketches of the instructors. You might remember Neto Almanza from last semester. He taught from last week. He did the video tips and tricks. Uh, there's Giovanni Insignaris, uh, our beloved lead instructor. Um, Angelo Otero, Andreina Santella, Carla Arguello, other marketing coaches of ours. And there I am with a, um, my blue plaid shirt. So anyway, Bruce, uh, without further ado, I wanted to uh, hand the floor over to you, the multi-talented uh, musician, sketch artist, mentor, branding guru, and dear friend, Bruce Turkel. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm just going to come back for the introductions. <laughs> I'm going to do this on a regular basis just to hear other people say uh, nice things about me. And I'm glad you all are here. And I was really glad when Nancy said that, that uh, entrepreneurs are reconfiguring their businesses, and I wrote this down, in any way they can, because that's kind of what I want to talk to you about today. It's a, if you're going to do something in any way you can, then why don't we do it the right way? And while these are, we keep hearing that on every single ad, unprecedented times, the truth is that things like this have happened a number of times, not exactly this way, perhaps not in this severity, not as personally effective of all of us, but there's been plenty of times where businesses needed to re stop reconsider what they were doing, reconfigure what they were offering, and then going out to the public and re-promoting who they were and what they were. And so there's lots of best practices and there's lots of proven tools, tips, and techniques that you can use to make a difference. And that's what I want to talk about today. I want to give you practical advice, real things that you can use tomorrow or this afternoon to figure out what to do next. Uh, Dan was nice enough to mention my last book, All About Them. And uh, when I finished writing it a few years ago, I then spent all my time promoting it. Remember that that list in the New York Times is not called the best writer's list, it's called the best seller's list. And so to be a successful author, you need to spend as much time selling your book as you do actually writing the book. When I finished that process, I started working on my next book and I spoke to my agent and I spoke to my publisher and they wanted me to write the sequel to this. They wanted me to write whatever came next in this series and I didn't find that particularly interesting. What I was interested in writing about was a book on pivoting and a book on changing. This is long before we even knew what the word coronavirus meant, but it just seemed to me that everybody that I knew, everybody in a certain age group, somewhere from 35 to 65, was looking to change their life. So I wrote a book titled, Is That All There Is? And the idea was gonna be that you reach a level of relative success, relative meaning perhaps you're not worrying about where your next meal has come from, but you haven't bought the Lear jet yet. But somewhere in between those two, you're doing pretty good. And uh, then you have to pivot. And you may have to pivot for good reasons. Some people pivot because they have a liquidity event and they get a lot of money. You may pivot for bad reasons. All the bad reasons seem to start with a D. Death, divorce, debt, disease, it's a couple more. But the point is that people need to change their lives. I took this idea back to my publisher, back to my agent, and they didn't have any interest in it. They said, look, it's not what we want from you. What we want is the sequel because that's where you have your success. I tried to write something different didn't interest me and I decided I was gonna do this project regardless. And I did, I finished the book. I called the publisher and I said, I, hey, I finished the book, do you want it? You have first right of refusal and they said, no, they didn't want it. So I had to reconfigure, repivot and figure out what I was gonna do with it. And then lo and behold, we have a pandemic and all of a sudden everybody is figuring out how to pivot. And I get a call from my agent who didn't say, hey, we were wrong, now we want the book. What they said was, send us a blurb because we want to put it in the catalog and it's due tomorrow. So all of a sudden, there's a flurry of interest. And so I've been spending my time thinking about how all of us reconfigure who we are and what we do. Now, the other day I wrote a blog post based on a quote that I read because people keep saying that we are in the same boat. And, uh, 
what I figured out is that we might be in the same storm, but we are not in the same boat. And then I read this, this um, quote that somebody wrote. I don't know who it was. I can't find the guy who, or the woman who wrote it. But they said, I heard that we are all in the same boat, but it's not like that. We are all in the same storm, but not the same boat. Your ship could be shipwrecked and mine might not be, or vice versa. For some, quarantine is optimal, a moment of reflection, of reconnection, easy in flip-flops with a cocktail or a coffee. For others, there is a desperate financial and family crisis and, and a mental health crisis. Some are safe in their homes, while others must go to the front line and face the virus head on. Now, my wife is a medical professional. She's a nurse practitioner. And every day she puts on scrubs and she goes to her medical office and then she goes to hospitals and then she goes to ALFs while I stay here and write books and work on webinars and practice the guitar. Um, so we are even in the same storm, but not in the same boat, even if we're sheltering in place. And I dare say that's true for all of you. But more importantly, it's true for your customers. It's true for your consumers. And it's true for your potential customers and consumers. Excuse me, and consumers. So what I want you to look at is not what you're going through as you pivot, but what the people you want to do business with are going through as they pivot. And how can we best serve them? I'm a big believer in standing on the shoulders of giants, in looking at what has been done before and now utilizing it to our best effect. When my son was a teenager, we had some typical teenage problems with him. And though I'm not a particularly religious person, I did find the uh, serenity prayer. And what I've realized is the serenity prayer is the perfect strategy for what we're going on right now. Accept the things that I cannot change. There are parts of your business that are gone. They are not coming back. If they do come back, they're gonna come back differently. Just yesterday, Ford and GM announced that they are cutting $1.5 billion in ad sales, meaning they're not gonna be purchasing television ads, they're not gonna be purchasing web ads, they're not gonna be purchasing magazine ads. They don't know when there's gonna be sporting events, they don't know how they're gonna reach their customers. But what they do know is they're not gonna spend that money. If you were a media sales rep, if you were a television company, you would have to accept that this is something you cannot change. There's no point in going back to them and yelling and screaming, you have to pivot. The next part of the prayer is the courage to change the things I can. We all know we can't change the people we do business with. The only thing we can change is ourselves. And so that's what we need to focus on. And finally, the wisdom to know the difference. We can yell and scream, we can tear our clothes, we can tear our hair, we can cry. But if we want to move forward, if we want to be successful, then we need to accept what's going on, we need to change what we can change, and we need to understand the difference. A couple of weeks ago, Dan invited me to come do a seminar just like this. And I did some information on how you look at the world and where it's going. And I know not all of y'all were on that seminar. So just very, very quickly, there were some very important points that I wanna make sure everybody gets because back in uh, 2008, during the Great Recession, Harvard Business Review did a very, very detailed study of how business changed in crisis. And there were three major points that they went through. Buyers, products and services, and next steps. And I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it because some of you have seen this, but it's a worthy refresher and it's important that you know it. The Harvard Business Review divided consumers into four categories. The slam on the brakes consumers, those are the ones who when something happens, they stick their head in the ground, they are ostriches, and immediately they stop doing business. Each one of you has a client, a consumer, a, a company that has done that. Number two are the pained but patient. Those are the people who are suffering, 
they're suffering a drop in, in, in their revenue, they're suffering a drop in opportunities, who knows what, but they're patient. They know that this too shall pass. I dare say that most of us on this call are in the pained but patient category. If not, you wouldn't be here. You would be somewhere else. Number three are the comfortable. Those are folks, I don't know what percent of the population, but folks who have enough assets, who have enough savings put away. Perhaps they have businesses that thrive in these times because some do, and they don't really have to change what they do very much. Perhaps they do for personal protection, but they don't for business. And then finally, you have the live for today folks. Those are the people who you might remember a few weeks ago were out on the beaches. And now today are the people who are refusing to put on masks, who are storming um, capitals. They do it for lots of different reasons, but basically they are saying, I'm gonna do what I wanna do today and damn tomorrow, damn the torpedoes. If you look at these four groups, it's pretty clear that the first group is no longer your customer. They may be your customer again one day, but they're not your customer now. And group number four, unless you sell something that they particularly want and you're gonna do it in a way that they will accept, they're not your customers either. The people you wanna focus on are groups two and three, pained but patient and comfortable. So they have the wherewithal to purchase what it is you're selling and they have need to do so on a consistent basis. Because let's face it, if you get someone a live for today person who will buy something once, great, you make a sale, but you don't build any sense of loyalty, you don't build any sense of community, you don't build anything that you can use going on. The second thing that Harvard Business Review talked about were products and services. And they divided products and services also into four categories, essentials, treats, postponables, and expendables. It's pretty clear what those are. Uh, essentials are things you have to have. Groceries are essentials. Some degree of medical care are essentials. Any of you who have studied Maslow and his uh, hierarchy of means, you know exactly what those things are. They are at the bottom of the pyramid, things like warmth, safety, security, food, medical care, those sort of things. Uh, treats are things you don't really need but you're still willing to make the extra effort to have them. If you're choosing to take a walk each evening, if you're going kayaking, um, if you're playing tennis, if you're buying ice cream when you're at Whole Foods or Publix, even though you have your mask on, those are treats. Postponables are the sorts of things that you need. You're gonna continue to need them, but maybe you don't need them now. Gasoline in your car is a perfect example of a postponable. You're not gonna stop driving, but you probably haven't been to fill your tank up in the last six weeks. And if you have, you certainly haven't done it as often as you used to. And then finally, you have expendables. Those are the things, not only can you get rid of them, but you may not go back to buying them. Most of us are spending our times at home, sheltering in place. We're probably eating a lot more than we used to. And as you read all the articles, many of us are drinking more than we used to. But the other thing, is that most of us are not gaining weight because what we're finding out is that restaurant food was incredibly fattening. And even though we're eating a lot, that all of a sudden that's changed. So restaurant food actually might prove to be expendable at some point. You might say, hey, this wasn't so terrible and I actually turned out to be a whole lot healthier. You need to look at what you do and divide them up into those categories because what you wanna do, of course, is spend your time money and energy at the top of the chart, the essentials and the treats, spend less effort on postponables and stop marketing expendables. Because if you are, what you're doing is you're answering the question nobody's asking. You're trying to sell something that no one's gonna buy regardless of what you do. I think the airlines, movie theaters are finding themselves in those positions. And then finally, HBR, Harvard Business Review, looked at next steps. What next steps should you take in order to maintain your business? And surprising no one, they again had four categories. They said to assess, that's what we're doing 24 seven these days, plan for the long term, track your audience and balance your budget. Those are three very important factors that you may not have thought of. For example, plan for the long term. All of us need to generate revenue immediately, I understand that. But what you can do now is use this time to set yourself up 
for sustainable business opportunities. So perhaps I see my buddy Bob Bonin on the, uh, on the line and Bob is a musician and you've probably seen him at the best restaurants and, and bars around the Keys and here and hotels and he plays music and he, he's just fabulous. And now he's performing from home. So if he's thinking about the long term, this is an excellent opportunity for Bob to increase his use of technology, to increase his online presence, to start putting together the things that he will be able to maintain after we can go back to some semblance of normalcy and he can go back to work and go back to doing the things that he was doing. Tracking your audience is critical because seismic changes in um, activity like what we have right now creates seismic changes in population. You remember after Hurricane Andrew that Weston, which was a failing community in West Broward, all of a sudden was filled up with people who needed to leave South Dade. But the interesting thing was after the storm was over and after South Dade was rebuilt, those people didn't come back. If you were tracking, if you weren't tracking your audience, you would have said, well, we can just fix these homes and we'll get our market back. But if you tracked your audience, you would have seen that once people got comfortable in Weston, sent their kids to school, decorated their homes, they weren't so quick to come back. So a lot of what you're doing now and a lot of what's happening now is going to be laying the groundwork for future opportunity. And finally, balance your budget. I already told you that Ford and uh, GM are cutting a billion and a half dollars out of their media budget, but they spend three or four billion dollars a year. They're not eliminating their budget. What they understand is they need to maintain brand loyalty. They need to let people know that they're there. I would suggest if you are marketing, you stop running that generic ad that everyone's running in these unprecedented times when we are looking around for what matters. Everyone's saying the same thing. I might go into the business creating generic ads that companies could just put their logos on because everyone's saying the same thing. So what I want to talk to you about today is how you can make that different. Most importantly, how you can achieve certainty in uncertain times. And Dan already told you the three points we're going to talk about. Not going it alone, knowing the number one thing that you should be doing right now. Okay, not right now, after you get off the webinar. And then um, how you can use today to reinvent tomorrow. I have not been looking at the chat at all. I've been too busy talking, so let me just look quickly. All right, if any of y'all have questions, um, things you want answered, please well, we feel do have free. one question. Yeah. Um, she messaged me privately. Um, Andrea Davidowitz, are you able to take yourself on mute and just ask him directly? Can you hear me now? Yeah. 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 Hi. Hi there. Hi there. Hi. Um, yeah. I am um, curious. I am a marketer in transition and I'm wondering companies perspectives. It seems to me the companies that are doing really well right now are doing gangbusters need to hire marketers because doing Zoom, you know, they're doing phenomenally well. And then have other companies that are uh, perhaps not doing well now. So, you know, are they investing in marketing with the vision of the future down the road or just kind of wondering your perspective on, um, on that? Well, I think it's safe to say that there are as many approaches as there are companies. I think some companies are investing and figuring out how they can pivot into what's going to happen. And other companies have thrown their hands up and don't know what to do. I think where you're going to see a lot of problems is companies who have opportunistically moved into areas that they know nothing about. For example, I can't tell you how many people called me maybe two weeks into the crisis to say that they were going to start bringing in sanitizer and masks. And would I create a brand for them for, um, that company. And I, I did a couple of them actually, but as I pointed out to them, that's only going to work for you as long as there is this immediate, immediate demand. As soon as market uh, uh, production catches up with need, you're not going to continue to get this business. It's the companies that have the relationships, that have the distribution models, all of those things. So I think a lot of companies who did not assess and did not track, but instead just said, where can we make a buck? that's where you're going to find the biggest problems. And if you're looking for any sort of long-term opportunities, 
I would stay away from those organizations. But the ones that either have figured out how to double down on who they are, or the ones who have figured how to move, but use their core competencies, that's where the real opportunities are going to be. Make sense? All right, let me, let me continue then. Um, so let's talk about not going it alone. One, one of the great things that you have right here, if you look at this grid of folks that are on this webinar, is you have a number of people who have brought, been brought together for a singular purpose. Now, many of us are in different businesses. Many of us are probably even in different places. We deal with different customers. I see my friend Sue Romanos, who's in the, uh, in the human resources business. I mentioned my, oh, hey, Jerome Hutchinson is here. Hey, Hutch. I see a bunch of people, my friend Bob, who's a musician. I see a bunch of people who do different things. Yet we are brought together for a common cause, which is to move forward and to figure out how to solve our problems. Think about the power that exists just on this screen alone. So for example, best practices. Well, I see Ken Tobin on the line and Ken Tobin is a contractor, is a specifically a painting contractor. We have hurricane season coming. Some people are gonna wonder what do I need to do to protect my home and more so, what do I need to do to be safe with what's going on? I don't know anything about paint. I don't know anything about construction. But if I had those questions, I could easily turn to Ken because his core competency is helping people with surfaces and all of the things that come with them. So by being able to be in a group where that group cares about you and your future, all of a sudden things become much easier to accomplish. Uh, you get a depth of experience and a depth of knowledge that maybe you didn't have access to before. When I sold my office building a few years ago, my father had always been my real estate consultant. My dad was a builder and a developer, and he knew all about those things. I don't know anything about him, sadly, for a number of reasons, but sadly, my father passed away, and I didn't know what to do in order to sell my, my building. I have a very good friend, a guy by the name of Seth Werner, who's a real estate investor. So I called Seth, and Seth walked me through the process. He told me what realtor to use, what contracts to accept, he looked at the contracts and he crossed things off. Don't ever sign this. Don't do this sort of thing. Um, and because of that, I was able to do a much better job. It's something I knew nothing about. So if you have people around you who have been through things like this before or who understand markets, or we just heard from a young woman who's a marketing expert. So it seems to me if you're in a business, but you're not a marketer, wouldn't it make sense to check with her? about what you should be doing. Keep in mind that a lot of the things that we are finding out for the first time, other people have seen many times. When uh, Columbus discovered America, he only discovered it for the folks back home in Europe. The Native Americans or uh, Dominicans really, who were on the island of Hispaniola, they knew they were there. They didn't actually get discovered. You know, if he said, I discovered, a new company? No, 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 you didn't. We were already here. When Lewis and Clark uh, went out and tracked the whole Louisiana purchase, they were taken by Native Americans who showed them around because those folks had already been there. We are not actually discovering new ways of doing things. We are simply finding new ways of doing them for us. The next thing that not going it alone gives you is gut check. Because keep in mind that right now, we are making a lot of decisions based on emotional concerns. I mentioned to you that my wife sees patients all day while I stay home. So we have very different ways of looking at what's going on. She comes home stressed out about completely different things than I'm stressed out about. And sometimes having a gut check allows you to get back on the straight and narrow, allows you not to freak out, not to believe that everything's over. I mean, Listen, most of us came on this call thinking, oh my God, what am I going to do? And then you heard in the last comment about companies that are doing phenomenally well and they're out there. So that gut check becomes very, very important. And then next is accountability. Things are going to happen that you don't want to deal with. Whether it's uh, getting rid of uh, employees that are not productive, whether it's downsizing your business, whether it's moving your business online, and telling someone else 
what you're going to do limits your ability not to actually do it. I'm in a mastermind group and I spent a lot of time talking to them about wanting to sell my business. When it came time to sell my business, there were a lot of things that were required that I didn't want to do. But I knew that there was no way that I could go back to my group and tell them I didn't do what I said I was going to do. And that sense of accountability forced me to be much more successful than I would have been otherwise. And the way to do all of that, by the way, is to create a personal, that's not bod, it's not short for body, it's board of directors. Each one of us needs to put together a group that looks out for our best interests, that we can count on when we need to get something done. I'm gonna to talk to you a little more about how I can help you do that if you're interested. I have a group, my friend Sue Romanos is in the group, uh, Hutch was in the group called the Strategic Forum. We are 40 business leaders and we get together once a month and talk about our businesses. And the currency of our organization is thank yous. At the end of every meeting, we go around the room and we thank each person for what they did for us. And it's actually sincere and it actually means that we have 40 people who are helping us be better at what we need to do. So that's why I believe the first thing to do is to understand you are not in this alone, to understand that we stand on the shoulders of giants and to make sure that you are taking full advantage of your tribe, of your community. I understand there's gonna be uh, talks coming up about that. And I think that's great because that's a critical thing to do when times are tough. Number two, the most important thing to do right now Now you're going to see a little bit of my uh, low tech magical special effects here because this is the one thing you need to understand. If, if you have to cut off the call directly after this, take this to the bank. This is what matters. People call me all the time now asking what they should do. And they say, you know, I need social media. Should I be on Facebook? Should I be in LinkedIn? Should I be on uh, Instagram? Should I be on Pinterest? And I always tell them the same thing. You don't need social media. You need a strategy. Remember that if you don't know where you're going, it doesn't matter which way you go. It doesn't matter which way you turn. If you don't write, ask the right questions, the answers don't matter. If you don't have a destination, how do you know that you got there? So the number one thing that each one of us need is to have a plan. You know that the, yes. A, that was super fancy. I know, I know. I love technology. You were, you were really upgrading. I'm telling you, it's the best. I had a whole thing, an on-screen thing where it slid in and it slid out. And then I thought, you know what? The heck with that. Scotch tape works every time. You never worry about it. You know, I, I, love, I love just everything about what you just did. That was great. <laughs> I actually stopped you intentionally because about this having a plan, um, you know, I've been hearing from a lot of business owners that they know where they want to get to, right? They'll typically, they'll say something like, I want to sell my business in five years. It's always five years for some reason. It's like far enough away that they don't really need to think about what to do today to get there, but they know they don't want to do this forever. Um, what I struggle with personally, and I hear a lot of them struggle with is, like there are a lot of paths that can get you to a sale. And how do you get to figure out like which of those paths will get you to your destination? In other words, how do you, how do you start building that plan? That's a great question. And you actually set it up perfectly as if we had rehearsed this, which, which we haven't. We have not. Um, if you know, if you have a five year window, then you do what is called an optimal outcome exercise, which is you actually write up what, what happens in five years, where you, you want to sell the business, what do you want to sell it for, uh, who do you want to sell it to, all those things, whatever it is, everybody's plan is different. Then you walk back to four years. If I'm going to do that in five years, where do I need to be in four years? If I'm going to do, and you make the list, well, I have to have spoken to prospects, I have to have X amount of revenues, I have to have X amount of of customers, I have to get rid of this debt, whatever it is. You then back it up to three years. 
you then back it up to two years, you then back it up to next year, you then back it up to today. Because what happens is when you work backwards towards an optimal outcome, the steps become very clear. You don't know what to do right now. We are all in this storm together. We don't know what to do right now, but we do know what we want five years from now. And we can figure out four years and maybe three. At two, it might get a little more complicated. But once, like, as I said, it, you, if you don't know where you're going, how do you know when you got there? You yeah. can't build a plan unless you have goals. So do an optimal outcome exercise. If anybody wants help with it, I'm, I'm happy to help. I'll show you how to do it. It works really well. I'm not talking about picturing yourself and manifesting the universe and all that kind of stuff. I am not a universe will provide kind of person. I'm talking about practical, clear, strategic steps to take to get somewhere. One follow-up. I'm going to use BizHack as an example because a lot of the people on this call will know about my business. So, you know, I prim primarily provide what I call retail classes for a B2C audience. And they're like, let's just call it two different paths to do the future of BizHack for five years so that I can sell it. One path would be to do more classes like that, kind of like a general assembly or a win code. Just do more classes like that, go online, get a national and international audience. And the other is to go more in a B2B space where I'm doing more corporate training uh, or maybe even becoming more of a, um, you know, like working with bigger clients. And, and how do I figure out if I see like there's two destinations that could get me where I want to go, but they're so different in terms of the path. And there's like a big fork in the road, B2B versus B2C. How do I figure out which five-year goal or vision do I want? Well, it's, it, there's, you know, my belief of, of proven practices, best practices, standing on the shoulders of giants. Yogi Berra said, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. Right. Sounds kind of bizarre if you're walking towards it. But if you're coming the other way, it's not a fork, is it? So build two optimal outcome strategies. Say, here's where I, if I go B2B, who do I want to be five years from now? If I go B2C, who do I want to be five years from now? Walk them both back, build them, build them as if they are your plan. Then turn around and walk them the other way. And I promise you, the solution will be clear. Because a fork in the road is not a fork in the road when you walk the other way. It's a straight path with a turn off. And you'll see it. And by the way, it may have you come up with a third opportunity because you may say, I could do this, but I could take something from over here and wait a second. If I, how about if I put them together and did it this way? Yeah. Creativity is not creating new things. Creativity is combining old things in new ways. If you're a musician, you know, there's only seven notes. Do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti. Do, do is an octave. It's the same note. Every piece of wit Western music ever written takes those same seven notes and puts them in different orders. You know, I, there's only uh, the amount of colors in the rainbow. There are no other colors. You yeah. can try to invent one. I, you know, uh, Dr. Seuss had on Beyond Zebra for letters after Z, but other than that, you can't actually do it. There's no other ways to function. So build them both out and work backwards. All right, I don't want to get off time here, so let me jump back. And Dan, I'm happy to talk to you about that some more. So. I talked about that you needed to not go it alone. You need to know the number one thing to do now and understand that right now is the perfect time to recreate yourself. And by the way, when I say yourself, I mean both you and your business. We're, we're looking at them interchangeably right now. Think about cornflakes. Everybody knew what cornflakes was. Everybody ate cornflakes if you grew up in this country. If you grew up in South America, you ate zucaritas or uh, other countries that had other names, but everybody ate them. And all of a sudden there were all these other cereals that came out with, with marshmallows and sugar and fruit and, and animal shapes and everything else. And then at some point there was a stage where all the uh, cereals that were coming out were quite simple. They were oats or bran. People were looking for healthier things. Cornflakes reinvented themselves with one of the, I think, maybe the top three 
uh, advertising lines in history, Corn Flakes said, try them again for the first time. Now think about what, who you are and what you do. Think about BizHack, since we all know BizHack. I took the class, I sat there, I showed up at the, uh, at the life sciences building twice a week, and then I did the online webinar. And so if you'd say to me, hey, you should come to BizHack, I would say, I've already done it. But if you said, BizHack, try it again for the first time, then I give you the Scooby-Doo head, huh? And you can say, well, we've moved it online. We've changed these things. We still stand for the fundamentals that we had before, teaching you how to work online, showing you the technology that you didn't understand. But the world has changed. The technology has changed. And we've changed right along with it. At which point I would have to say, oh, you know, that's a good point. I should go find out what's new. It's the same. I turned, by the way, dramatically to look at all of you in the grid. None of you can tell what I, that I did that, but I felt it anyways. So thank you, uh, Serena, for smiling. I appreciate it. Um, so I'm so used to speaking to audiences. You see, I'm learning. I'm pivoting. You're watching me pivot right in front of you. Um, so think about how people can try you again for the first time. Because just like you have changed, they have changed. Their situation has changed. What they needed have changed. And that brings up a very strange dichotomy of being new and interesting and exciting, but remembering to stay with the fundamentals that got you where you are. We stand on the shoulders of giants. Sometimes those giants are ourselves. Sometimes it's who we used to be. Sometimes it's our reputations. When Dan introduced Nancy, he didn't just tell us what she's doing right now. He told us what she had done. Where, remember that, from the Herald. So we, now when I go to look at Nancy's blog posts, I'm gonna try her again for the first time because I'm gonna get what I knew, but I'm gonna get it in a new way, in a new environment and with a new goal. I wanna give you another company that's done that beautifully. So Porsche, those of you who know me know that I'm a car fanatic and specifically German cars and specifically Porsche 911. Porsche was always known as the performance sports car company. But what you might not know is that 65 of their percent of their sales are SUVs, the Cayenne and the Macan. And then if you Hopefully he'll come back here in a sec. Are you guys able to hear me? Yeah. Yeah, we can hear you. I hope we didn't lose him. We might have lost him there. Um, well, while we're waiting for him to come back, he might have to uh, log off and log back in. Uh, we'll go a little bit longer um, so he can finish his presentation. Thanks for sticking with us. Um, are there any questions that you guys have uh, about uh, what he's talking about? Um, anything? I know we, uh, Melissa, I owe you the question about how to deal with this in the niche area. Um, I found that exercise he talked about really, really valuable in terms of how to think ahead. Um, I have a group of advisors, uh, some of whom are actually on this call, who've been asking me like, Dan, what's your plan uh, for all this? Like, what are you doing this for? What do you hope, where do you hope to get with this? And uh, I realized in thinking about it that I actually don't know the answer to that. And the truth of the matter is that if I don't know the answer to that, the next three years will be like the last three years which is I'm doing a lot of activity and working really hard, but I'm not necessarily advancing against the larger goal to, to make this an even you know, bigger thing. I mean, ultimately, I know that I love serving you know, business owners, including small business owners and mid-career professionals. Uh, so I know what kind of the mission is and how that feels to serve it, but I don't know, just to be very frank and vulnerable about it, like I don't know where that's gonna lead to. Um, you know, right now I'm a struggling business owner like many of you who, you know, is relying on um, government support and, and a lot of hustle to just scrape by. And I don't want to scrape by forever. Um, and so how, how can I kind of reimagine or at least sort of have a destination in mind so that I can start working towards it with my day-to-day -day activities? Um, I don't know if any of you guys feel 
that as well. Um, and how you project yourself in the world, in other words, what we call marketing, if it's not founded on why you're doing it and where you hope to go, the projection is going to be off. You're going to be like headed potentially in the wrong direction. So, you know, I, I talk a lot in my workshops about the importance of your why and understanding your why, uh, the why you do what you do and how important it is to have that as the foundation of everything you say. But I'm coming to realize there's another key element that is nearly as important, which is the why do you, are you doing what you're doing and where um, are you, do you want to go next? Um, does anyone want to reflect on that while we wait for Bruce to rejoin us? Hey, Dan, I think that, um, you know, the comments that you were making uh, out of Bruce's uh, comments as related to making sure that you have a team around you, uh, that team is so critically important. But as you're talking about the why, <clears throat> you know, it kind of even goes back to what Bruce was saying. You know, if you don't know where you're going, you're like any road will take you there. And um, your why is the thing that when we're in a situation like we're in today with this pandemic and what you've been used to doing, you know, you've got to do differently. The why is your rudder. It means that the storm is and, you know, we're in the boat and we're being kicked around. If you don't have a why, you don't know reason what's making you your purpose, your, your vision, and all those things are tied to that. So, you know, Simon Sinek has a great TED Talk piece on, you know, why for, for leaders and so on that anybody has never seen it. I highly recommend that you watch it three or four times uh, because you'll get something out of better and different each time. But that why really is the anchor to understanding what it is that you're trying to do. It defines your purpose and also make sure that you are tied into knowing when you get up every morning that you're not just going to do something, but you're doing it for a reason that you believe in, you're committed to, and so on and so forth. Absolutely. Alana, did you want to weigh in? Yeah, hi, hi Dan. Great hey. to see you. Yeah. Thanks for hosting this. Hello, everybody. Um, so I actually coach and consult in this intersection um, on transformation and reinvention, and I'm um, yes, and I'm, and I'm also just a shout out in case anyone is in the food system, which hits many, many segments of the Miami economy. Uh, I have a background in the food space, so I'll be um, working with those who are looking to, at this point in time, particularly pivot and, and get, get, go forward, not get back. But one thing I would just say that was excellent comment that the individual just made is, yes, I think that in the vision uh, that you may be holding as to your why and your purpose, you may want to ask yourself, is it? sort of big enough? Is it bold enough? Um, you may also find that the piece that you think is your purpose might be a bit more tied to your what than your why. And I do agree that the Simon Sinek, we use this a lot as well in the coaching space, but it's, just, it's super critical to go back to those fundamentals, that rudder that was just mentioned, because the piece you're asking about, Dan, about thinking like, well, wait, where do I really want to go? That's tied into that, that piece on your purpose, on your vision. So I think for others at this time who are jolted accidentally and not knowing where they, you know, really can go, they have to do a reassessment um, of their current terrain and, and various options on that pivot. But we, but every single um, engagement that I've been in in the last, you know, week or two is discussing to return to your purpose and really recheck into that. And for some, it may be expanded, and for some of it may be a pivot in and of itself. You know, uh, Alana, there are probably some other folks who would be interested in learning more about what you're saying if you want to put your contact info in the chat. And I have, do. I have Bruce on the phone. Hey, Bruce. Hello. Can you all hear me? Yes. We see so a little green, green phone icon instead of your pretty face. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. I don't know what happened. Does I've never seen Zoom just turn off, and every time I go to turn it back on, it just crashes. I don't. I, I've done now on my iPad, my laptop, my computer. I don't know. Uh, but if you don't mind not seeing what I'm saying, and too bad too, because I had all these great drawings coming up. But regardless, huh. I can uh, I can walk you through the rest. I did just hear talking about what and why. And I didn't hear the precursor to that, but I would add um, that I'd be very careful 
not to build a pivot based specifically on what you do. And the reason being that ability to do a job today is cost of entry. If you can't do what you do, you don't have a business. But just because you can do it doesn't mean you have a business either. I think you're going to see, as I said earlier, all the people that rush into the PPE business but don't have a reason to be there other than it's an opportunity. The minute that opportunity lessens, they're going to be in big trouble. Now, thanks to technology, your competitive set is not immediately in your geographic area. So just because you're the best person at what you do in your area does not mean that you have a practical or a sellable or a sustainable business. People don't buy what you do, they buy who you are. When it comes to necessities, they might buy them anywhere they can find them. But as soon as there's competition, as soon as there's choice, as soon as there's opportunity, you will no longer find yourself in a competitive position. And because I think it's very important that we reinvent and pivot for the long term, I would really caution people about pivoting simply based on a function. Very helpful. Um, Bruce, uh, the floor is yours. Um, you know, the vast majority of folks have stuck around for you. So take the time to, to make the points you have and uh, you can send us, um, uh, we, you can post some of the images on social media or we'll figure out another way to share those. But I, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Um, so what I was saying was that Porsche does 65 to 80% of their business not selling sports cars. And I was, I was uh, reading about their design director, a guy by the name of Michael Maurer. And Maurer said, and it's so appropriate for what we're doing right now, that change helps keep an organization young and fresh. But on the other hand, there's a risk you lose the connection from one product to the next. If you want to build strong brand identity and a strong business, you need continuity. That doesn't mean you don't take on new technology. It doesn't mean you don't look for new markets. However, it means that instead of making radical changes, you resist and look for the components that people come to you for. He said, I believe there's no point changing unless it's to make it better. And from that, he has three rules, and I think these three rules are brilliant. While you are looking for your pivot, while you are creating your new persona, think about these three things. And you'll notice that none of them are about function. Number one, can you see a difference? Will your consumer see something different between who you are and who your competition is? Number two, and more importantly, can they feel the difference? Because the emotional response to the difference is the key. And then number three, can you tell a story around it? Think about how many of you drive sports cars, cars capable of going over 150 miles an hour on the Autobahn. We live in Miami. You can't drive 35 miles an hour on I-95. Think about how many of you drive SUVs, big, powerful, four-wheel drive vehicles designed to go off-road, through ice, through snow, up hills, down dirt roads. We live in Miami. We have no ice. We have no snow. We have no dirt roads. Maurer says that people who live in America, China, and Switzerland who never drive fast, are not allowed to drive fast, all want a car with 600 horsepower because there's a story behind it. And as you look to build your new reinvented brand and persona, I want you to think about the story. The story is going to be one of problem and solution. The coronavirus is going to become a legend. It's going to become lore. We are going to talk about it just like people talk about the Black Plague. And so your story of how you were Phoenix-like, how you emerged from the ashes, will be the thing that people are going to talk about. If you can stay consistent with who you are and what you do, 
and you can build a story, then what you'll find is that your reinvention works. And just one more point I want to make is that there's a song by a country, uh, country singer named Jason Isabel. And the song is called Something More Than Free. And he says, I don't think on why I'm here or where it hurts. I'm just lucky to have the work. On Sunday morning, I'm too tired to go to church. But I thank God for the work. I thank God for the work. And as we all start to get disappointed, depressed, concerned, I think we have to remember that we have work to do. We have work to do to secure our own financial futures. We have work to do to secure the financial futures of our family, of our neighbors, of our community. So each time you say to yourself, this is really hard, please use some of the things that I've talked to you about. Please make sure that you're not going it alone. Make sure that you're using best practices, that you're standing on the shoulders of giants. Please make sure you have a plan. You're not just running willy-nilly, screaming with your hair on fire. Please recreate yourself in a way that creates a difference that people can see, they can feel, and they can tell a story about it. And more importantly than that, even when the, when the um, Zoom goes down, when the technology's not working, Thank God for the work, because it's this work that's going to save all of us. Thank you very much for listening, and thank you very much for putting up with my technology challenges. And thank you, Bruce, for sticking with us. Um, everybody, please send him your uh, thanks uh, along with the group chat. And uh, if you stick around, I wanted to share with you guys um, a really exciting opportunity. Uh, so Bruce, if it's okay, I'll, I'll launch into that and, and then uh, let you take it away. So, yeah, sure. You know, Bruce, as you know, has uh, been traveling the, the country and the world giving uh, uplifting and educational talks like this about branding and marketing and how to survive and thrive in times of uncertainty. Um, and uh, Bruce himself has had to pivot his business um, in a really exciting way and in a way that could directly benefit many of us on this call. So Bruce uh, is publicly announcing to his 250,000 uh, LinkedIn followers uh, tomorrow um, that he's going to be launching uh, his first ever masterclass, uh, a 12 week class on these topics, as well as a separate 12 week mastermind group uh, that'll follow on from there. Uh, mastermind groups are more discussion-based. Master classes are more like educationally based. Um, and he's um, pricing it at a place that's affordable for many of us. Um, the uh, I believe it's twelve hundred dollars for one or the other, or eighteen hundred dollars for both. And he's been so kind as to give our community a day uh, heads up about this in case we wanted to raise our hand and say, I'm interested in learning more. Um, there's gonna be a survey link that you can fill out. There's no commitment required. It's just basically to get yourself in the front of the line. Um, I'll put the survey link in the chat. Uh, it'll also be in a follow-up email that Lilia is gonna be sending shortly. Um, Lilia, if you're listening, um, I think I put he had 17,000 LinkedIn followers. He actually has 250,000. So if it's not too late and you want to change that, uh, otherwise it's just a typo that was my fault. But anyway, uh, Bruce, uh, could you tell us a little bit more about this master class and why uh, we might want to participate in it and, and also tell us about the mastermind group as a separate offer? Sure. Yeah, that was great, Dan. Thank you very much. Uh, it's quite simple. I told you in the beginning about working with others, people who have your back, people who are available to hear your ideas, to give you a gut check, to give you the benefit of their knowledge, their experience, to allow you to have deeper bench depth in your life and in your business. I'm a huge proponent of this. I, I actually belong to three of them, the strategic forum that I mentioned to you, another group that we go up to Rhode Island every year called the Elite Retreat, where we get together and we work on each other's businesses. And when I tell people about it, they always say, how do you find people? How do you, and it's, it's, it's really not hard to find people. It's hard 
to keep people within a structure that benefits all of them. So since I've done this so much, I want to provide this to others because I, I know that it's a great solution to help people find certainty, know exactly what to do. The second part is that there's really no benefit of moving forward without knowledge. And there's no need to reinvent the wheel. So much of these things have been figured out already, which is why I decided to put together the master class. We're going to go through 12 very clear chapters on how you build your brand, how you build your business, how you reinvent, how you understand your audience. I mean, the title of my last book, All About Them, was specifically about building a brand that is not about you, but ironically is about your audience. And people always want to know how. And that's what I'm going to show you all how to do. But more importantly than either of those is I really want to build tools that benefit the people who participate. And so Dan mentioned that there's a questionnaire. The, the URL is a bit.ly, so it's bit, B-I-T dot L-Y slash I want your opinion. There's no obligation. It doesn't sign you up. It doesn't cost you anything. It's just me saying, hey, here's what I think the issues are. Here's what I think we need to talk about. But I want to know what's keeping you up at night. I want to know what you need to solve to attain certainty. Because I understand the value of certainty, the value of having a plan, the value of knowing where we're going. And I want to know how we can best do that for you. As all of you know, these sort of things work when you have statistical relevance. Statistical relevance happens when people participate. So if you would hop onto that questionnaire, uh, Bitly, I want your opinion, and just answer, I, I forget, I think there's five or six questions. It's very easy. You can let me know what specifically you want to deal with, and if we can be helpful, you'll get that opportunity. Great. Well, um, we have a, a lot of folks, uh, 66, who've stuck around. Um, if any of you guys had any questions, if you want to learn a little bit more about Bruce's offer, you know, I... Um, I wanted to make this available to you guys, to, to this community, because I really believe in what Bruce does. Uh, I've learned so much from him. You know, at the beginning of when I started my journey um, as a digital marketer, Bruce remembers I came like a puppy dog to him and asked him for guidance and advice, and he took me under his wing and uh, really set me on a great direction and has been a dear friend and even a client of mine ever since. So, you know, this is a little bit of the paying it back, the generosity. You know, those of you who know him also know that Bruce is just a, an incredibly good and generous and kind-hearted uh, community member and a person who's been doing so much for so many years. Um, and I, you know, he's also following on a family tradition, uh, the Turkel family tradition. So um, any, any questions um, from the group? Um, I'm getting some feedback from Melissa Hunter and Will Ezell. Uh, that uh, <laughs> that they love the questionnaire because uh, it has a video embedded in it. Um, any any uh, anyone want to take themselves off mute and ask Bruce a question directly? It's a great opportunity to to learn more about what you might get out of the master class and, and and the mastermind group. Hi, Bruce. This is Melissa. I've never been in a mastermind group, but I've heard about them for years. Can you tell me a little bit more about it? Sure. Uh, the technology originated with a guy by the name of Napoleon Hill, who wrote Think and Grow Rich. And he was hired by, oh, I just forgot, one of the great uh, millionaire robber barons of the 20s and 30s to travel around and um, interview famous and rich people to find out what their secret of success was. And almost to a man, they talked about surrounding themselves with people who had their backs. I can tell you that the key to being a successful musician is to surround yourself with better musicians. Years later, a woman who lives in our community, a woman by the name of Susan Ford Collins, was hired by Buckminster Fuller to do exactly the same thing, to travel around and interview successful people to understand where their success came from. Thanks, Rick. Rick just told me it was Andrew Carnegie who hired Napoleon Hill. Um, and Buckminster Fuller hired Susan, and she wrote the book, The Technology of Success and the Joy of Success and talked about the importance of having people around you. And there's a number of reasons why. All the things we discussed, bed step, best practices, but also accountability, which is a big one, but also so you don't just start smoking your own exhaust. 
so you don't get high on your own supply, as the uh, pushers motto used to be. But instead, you are talking to people who care about you and what you do. So quite simply, the way the group works is that we all get together on a regular basis. We get to know each other through personal exercises, through stories, and then we start talking about things that we have learned, things that we are benefiting from that we think everybody can use, and also things that uh, we need to figure out. We can vet new ideas with the group. We can discuss how to go deep on a concept. We can point out all sorts of different opportunities, tools, tips, techniques that we use for success. And by doing it in a structured format, each time someone gets up and talks about what they're doing, what I have found is that I learn more from hearing what others are doing than when I actually talk about my own business. By the way, Melissa, I love your name. It's my daughter's middle name. And I will just tell you quickly that I was sitting on the couch playing the song Melissa, which I played with my friend Bob, who's on the call. Um, and my daughter was six years old and she asked me if I wrote that song for her. And I said, I didn't write the song. She said, who did? And I said, uh, Greg Allman wrote that song, baby. And she said, did he write it for me? And I said, of course, yes, he did. So um, Greg Allman wrote that song for you, Melissa. And it's a beautiful song and a beautiful name. Hey, Bruce, it's Hutch. Um, as always, man, you knock it out of the park. Really enjoyed uh, all the insights and sharing that you did. Absolutely. I, uh, Thank you, Hutch. Sure. Uh, on the uh, mastermind group, uh, how long does that uh, run or does it have a time out? I mean, a time end or does it just an ongoing uh, group? Um, we're going to do the first one, if I remember correctly, and don't hold me to it, but I believe it's 12 weeks. Um, it's a, there are three hour sessions at a time with breaks and everything all worked into them. And then again, because this is it's not what I do regularly, I mean, I do these for corporations. It's not what I do doing them for individuals, but I think it's such an important thing right now. Just like with this questionnaire, I'm then going to ask everyone, how do you want to continue? How do we want to proceed? We're going to build a big community of people who are helping each other. I have a lot of information to be bringing into it. We have a lot of guest speakers that I've lined up, specifically successful people who are going to talk about what they do, how they did it, how they pivoted. Remember that I've interviewed all of these people for that book that I just wrote. Um, is that all there is? And so we have access to all of them. So it's going to grow organically. But the initial plan is a 12-week program. Got it. Thank you. I'm going to also weigh in a little bit here. I, I really think that this is kind of a, a little bit of a unique opportunity. Because if I had to guess, uh, and Bruce has sort of hinted at this, but I'm sort of extrapolating, Bruce is developing a new curriculum. And he's testing it out, uh, a curriculum that's based on like hundreds, if not thousands of blog posts and speeches and all this content he's created, books that he, over the years, but he's creating for the first time a consumer oriented curriculum. And you're going to get to experience it live, but then it's going to probably become available more as a recording. Um, and you might not have access to Bruce live because he might be off giving keynote addresses. So I think there's, there's a, an opportunity here to be part of a co-creation with one of our brightest lights and to see him create and refine it in real time, which is gonna be another whole like layer of learning that will happen in addition to his actual lessons. Am I getting some of that right, Bruce? Yeah, actually that was quite beautiful, but I do wanna make one thing clear. That's true for the master class. We are developing new curriculum and that's going to be available and then it will be available for sale, but without personal uh, uh, attention. The mastermind though, no, the mastermind, we do not record them. They are absolutely confidential. People swear to confidentiality. That's really where we're in this together. Um, I don't want to make any, any promises of, of how intimate they get, but I've been in some that have been incredibly intimate on the issues that we deal with and how we deal with them. So nobody will see what happened. That's a very limited, special, insular group that, that, that is responsible only to each other. The master class, yes, it will be available. Now, both of them, you will see how this process develops. All of that is correct. Other questions? Can I ask a question about the, the Bruce's presentation? 
Absolutely. Please, anything you want. Yeah, so this is Tina Walther. Um, so, you know, during this transition of what's going on, um, the thing that has helped me survive is I have a lot of restaurants um, because probably because I used to run restaurants. So I know what their struggles are and I can brand them very well. So what I found is in Michigan, it has become an essential because people need to get out of their house. They're tired of eating their own food. And so it kind of moves into that market that you were talking about um, for the Harvard um, study. The question, well, no, not the question, what it makes me want to do now is to invest in more restaurants. But then I worry about that and I see my clients doing the same thing. It's like, okay, these are the people that helped me survive. And now maybe I need to do more of those. So if this ever happens again, I know that my base is there and I can be okay. But that worries me because then they become too niche and they've kind of closed them off. And then the next, pandemic or whatever god forbid comes could be totally different so can you kind of speak to that of how i can convince them not to be like that and then also myself oh uh, well i think it's important to understand that um while every situation is different a number of things happen that are similar for example the um hang on i'm just fooling with my technology now trying to get back on um when we had 9-11, I, the Miami Tourism was my client, and we worked with bringing people to Miami. Now, think about it. When we have a hurricane, our infrastructure is damaged, and people don't want to come because infrastructure has been destroyed. But during 9-11, our infrastructure wasn't touched at all. Our infrastructure was perfect. Nothing happened here. People weren't coming because they weren't willing to do the transition from wherever they were to be in Miami, to fly, for example. So we needed to understand how to, re, how to reinvigorate people's interest in visiting a different place. And that's where the whole all about them concept came from. It had nothing to do with us. It only had to do with them. And what did we need to do to get them to want to be here? It's the same with the restaurant business. So You've already said that it's going to come back. You know it's going to come back. The question is, what happens when something else happens? And we know something else is going to happen. The only thing we don't know is what or when. But we also know that what happens will be along certain lines. Is the infrastructure destroyed? Is the infrastructure intact? Are the consumers willing to come? What is it they're concerned about? And by knocking these things off one at a time, what we do is we build a stronger more powerful and, and most importantly, more compelling opportunity for them to do business. And by the way, that's where the profits are. So it makes sense to get into the business when you're able to provide that level of creativity and thinking, not after someone else has done it. Rothschild said the time to buy is when there's blood in the streets, even if it's your own. There was a question in the chat about whether you're capping attendance at the master class and the mastermind group. Absolutely. The mastermind is capped. There, we have to be able to have FaceTime with everybody involved. The master class will not be capped because we can send more and more information to more and more people. The mastermind is a very um, specialized and really very exclusive program. It's to make sure that all of us have FaceTime so that we can real world laboratory our ideas. Master class is distribution of great information. Very different. Is the mastermind group going to be uh, by application or is there a selection process or how are you going to constitute that? <laughs> if I told everybody how we were doing that, they'd all get in. Yes, of course. There's going, people are going to be um, looked at for their willingness to participate and their willingness to uh, accept the rules of the group. This is not about politics. This is not about, um, we, we don't want personal in, insults. We don't want anybody being unencouraging. We simply want folks who are there to be helpful to themselves and to others. Uh, it's sometimes known as the no asshole rule. Um, I mean, that's exactly what I call it actually. That is the rule. Yeah. I mean, it's the exact same reason why I, 
require an application for my courses. I, I don't let people in because I've come to learn that uh, one bad apple can spoil the bunch. It's really uh, a very um, sensitive thing running a, running a community and running a class and, and running a, a group uh, where peer coaching is an important component. And, um, you know, I'm always evaluating people first, like, are they going to get what they want out of this? Is this a good fit for their needs? And, and do they have a, a project that's good fit for what we teach? And then are they the kind of person that I want to spend 20 or 30 hours with? Um, and others would want to as well. So there's kind of a generosity of spirit that we look for in these conversations as well. Um, and Dan, let, let me add, you may not remember this, but when you, when we talked about BizHack, and I suggested that you limit your uh, classroom seats to people, and I think that's where you got the no asshole rule, you thought I was daft. <laughs> you said to me, wait a second, I need as many people who are as willing to pay as possible. So that's an evolutionary uh, thing that you've come around to, and I'm glad to hear it. You know, and there's also a marketing reason for doing it, which is scarcity breeds value. So, you know, just to be transparent about it, if you have a course where anybody can get in, you don't want to be in it. But if you have a course that's by application only, you're more likely to want it. So it does, it serves many purposes. There's a marketing purpose, but I think the higher purpose is the no asshole rule and to kind of preserve and protect the community. And I told you, Bruce, you're my mentor, man. I'm learning from you and I can't plan to continue with it. As, as I think it was Groucho Marx who said, I wouldn't join any club that would have me as a member. I was thinking the same thing. Guys, uh, we have a few more minutes here. Bruce, uh, any other questions? Feel free to unmute yourself and ask them. Uh, we have a question here from DR. Is this a landmark forum or similar to a landmark forum? I have never been to landmark, so I don't know if it's similar. I doubt it. Um, I don't think so either. I, I know I have friends who have been, but I have not. So I neither have copied it, nor do I know what they do specifically. You know, I've been to a landmark info session and, and that's, it seems a little bit more of like a pyramid where you go in at a low level and they keep selling, upselling you to higher and higher commitments. And there's also a, a multi-level marketing component where you then sell other people on it. None of those components are, are true here. The, the mastermind yeah. group, is a very well-known, well-established methodology. And if you Google mastermind group, it doesn't, it's not owned by any corporation. It's really a, a format or a technology that as, um, as Bruce mentioned, Napoleon Hill invented, but it's kind of given to the world. Uh, and now lots of people run mastermind groups that are unaffiliated with any centralized organization. Bruce, you want to add to that? Um. No, I was that. That was that was perfect. Sue Romanos, Sue, I'm going to read what you wrote, but come on, nothing with Bruce is similar to anyone else. To anything else, <laughs> <laughs> Sue is such a fan of yours. Uh, Sue is also part of a mastermind group that you've been running for many years called the Strategic Forum. Sue, can you unmute yourself and talk about the Strategic Forum? There might be, you know, a sense of what a mastermind group looks like from that. Well, it's a little bit different with Strategic Forum, but I've gotten to know Bruce over the years, and uh, if it wasn't for Strategic Forum, I probably never would have known him. But to know him is to know that his knowledge, his experience, and anything that you ask of him is, is completely different than anything that I've ever experienced. Um, Bruce looks at things with a different perspective, and if he's running this, if he's running this type of a situation, believe me, it's going to be a problem because everything that he does is pretty extraordinary. I'm a big fan, obviously. <laughs> Thank you, Sue. Thank you very much. But the Strategic Forum is a group of um, CEOs that we get together on a monthly basis. Um, we're both on the board of that organization, and we uh, have guests every month that talk about their various businesses and, um, and so on. So it's a little different. It's not a mastermind group, really. But we help each other. And that is really the essence of the organization. And, 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 you know, Bruce, how long have you been a part of that, that group uh, that you founded with that? We, we founded it, I think this is our 16th year. Wow. So. 16 years. I think Bruce was a founder. 
and I've probably been in it for about 13. Yeah, this is this is a not something that Bruce launches lightly and something that he has decades of experience doing. So, I mean, it's why I'm willing to kind of just jump in on faith because you know, the quality and integrity of everything he does, and I just don't see how this could be anything other than just a really profound experience. I also, on a personal level, I'm lonely as hell, both as a business owner and being stuck at home with my family. I mean, I love my family, uh, beautiful kids and a fabulous wife, but I miss you guys. I miss seeing you. I'm an extrovert. I love the tactile thing. And I don't quite get that, you know, when you have 100 people on a Zoom. So have a more intimate group and make friends in a new way is something I'm really excited about. Um, DR, I see your hand raised. Um, I don't know if we answered your question, but, um, you know, if you wanted to weigh in, uh, we have time for maybe one more question before we go. Yeah, you uh, answer it. Thank you. You're welcome, of course. Uh, well, Lana, thanks so much for, for sharing. Um, we uh, really appreciate your participation and help uh, during the little technical glitch. And is there anybody else uh, who had a last question before we wrap up? Okay. Um, thank you guys so much. Um, Robert Rubin, it's really exciting to see you here. Mary Ellen uh, uh, was uh, awesome, uh, awesome here uh, for a while, which was great. Uh, Mary Ann, excuse me. Uh, I'm going to be using what Bruce taught me for our VMT meeting on Friday. Um, really appreciate all of you guys uh, for support, for sticking with us. Bruce, thanks for rolling with the technological difficulties. And uh, I look forward to seeing you in class and at the Mastermind Group. Uh, next week, we have Ellen Marchman. Um, and uh, the week after that, we're going to be talking about um, community. Uh, so I really hope you can join us for that, as well as the FEMA uh, webinar on Thursday about SEO. Have a great one. We'll see you here in a week. Bye, everybody.